Welcome to Object-Oriented Coding in Python, Design and Guidance. My name is Christopher, and I will be your guide. This is the third part of a multi-part course. Parts 1 and 2 are about the how of object-oriented coding, covering the syntax of classes in Python, and how to use its attributes and methods. As everything in Python is an object, that includes intricate details, such as how operations like adding and multiplying apply to your objects through Dunder methods. This third part of the course is a little different. It's a bit more about the why and approach. The focus in this part of the course is about how to build better object-oriented software, and in some cases, why you maybe shouldn't use OO techniques at all. This third part of a three-part course teaches you about how the Pythonic object-oriented approach compares to other languages, when not to use classes in Python, alternatives to inheritance, and the solid principles. The code in this course was written with Python 3.11. Object-oriented coding in Python has gone through some changes over the years, and so the code presented here won't work in Python 2 without being altered. Python's a bit of a weird beast language-wise. Its history is firmly in the procedural style scripting world, but it has flavors of functional programming and object-oriented coding inside of it. This means you can choose how much or how little you use object-oriented techniques when you code. It actually is very object-oriented underneath, but you don't have to use that mental abstraction if you don't want to. If you're coming from other languages, especially those which are object-oriented first, this leap can be a bit of an adjustment. If you're an experienced coder in one language, your first tendency when writing code in a new language is to use the style you're familiar with, even if it isn't a good fit for your new language. As a Python coder, if you come across a lot of object-oriented code where you're wondering why they didn't just use a dictionary, there's a good chance the original writer was an ex-Java person or something similar. Once you do decide to write some object-oriented code, whether in Python or any other language, there are some guiding principles that should be followed. This course is primarily about those principles. You want to write clean code that can be supported by others, structure your code for reuse following the dry, that's don't repeat yourself, principle, and you also want to take advantage of duct typing, or more formally, polymorphism, where the interface to the object determines how it is used, and it can be passed around to other code which doesn't have to be concerned with its underlying implementation. And once you start building classes on top of each other, you want to do so in a fashion where you aren't designing yourself into a corner, keeping your code flexible for future changes. There's an acronym out there that can help you think about these ideas. It's named SOLID, the expansion of which is confusing and a paragraph full, so I won't call it anything but SOLID until you get to that part of the course. Before spending some time on SOLID, let's talk about whether you should orient your objects at all. In the previous lesson, I gave an overview of the course. In this lesson, I'll talk about when and when not to use an object-oriented approach in Python. If you come from a language like Java, where everything must be a class, your first tendency in Python might be very Java-like. But Python enables several different coding styles. Procedural, which is script-like coding. Functional, which uses things like lambdas and MapReduce. And what all the parts of this course have been about, object-oriented concepts. Having this much choice is powerful. But you know that Spider-Man line about great responsibility? Choosing the wrong techniques may overcomplicate your job as a programmer. Let's briefly talk about a couple of other popular languages. If you're coming from Java, or quite frankly C++, and although I've never used it, I suspect C Sharp falls into this bucket as well, simple programs don't need classes at all in Python. You should write classes when writing a class is a natural extension of the data you're encapsulating. If you have some data attributes you need to keep together and some operations that are dedicated to them, then you might want a class. For shorter programs, you can often get away with using a dictionary, a tuple, or more specifically a named tuple, or now that Python has data classes, that might also be a good compromise. If you're coming from JavaScript, 
Welcome to a saner world. Sorry, just couldn't help but get that dig in. Classes in JavaScript are prototype based. There are a couple of other languages that use this approach as well, but they're not as common. Python, like most other object-oriented languages, uses a structured declarative approach. If you're used to ES6 style JavaScript using the class keyword, you won't notice much difference syntactically, but the underlying mechanics of inheritance are different, so you might need to be careful as you dig in. And since JavaScript was also originally a procedural language with object-oriented semantics layered on top, the easy mixing in Python will be familiar to you. Unlike most other object-oriented languages, Python does not strictly enforce the concept of private or protected. All things are accessible. There is a convention that members with a leading underscore are non-public, and users of your class shouldn't rely on those kinds of attributes, but it is just a convention. They can still be used through the interface. There's also some weird black magic, um, okay, gray magic, dirty white, off page magic, where double underscores cause a member to be name mangled. That's a fancy way of saying it is automatically renamed. This kind of works like private in that it hides it away, but if you know how to produce a mangled name, you can still call it. You probably shouldn't, but the language doesn't prevent you. It's sort of a thin ice sign rather than a fence. You can ignore it, but there might be some consequences. Python has had object-oriented concepts for a long time, but it changed how they work in Python 2.2. In that version, oh so long ago, the underlying hierarchy was changed. So the ultimate ancestor of your class in Python 2.1 and 2.2 are different. For backwards compatibility, 2.2 allowed you to declare a class using either the old style or the new style. To indicate you wanted a new style class, you inherit from the object class. To declare a person using the new class, it looks like this, where person inherits from object. Of course, the new in the phrase new style is rather dated. It's from very long ago. The compatibility supporting both old and new styles was available all the way up to 2.7. Since the end of life of Python 2.7 was in 2020, that new thing continued to exist for almost two decades. By contrast, Python 3 only uses the new style of classes. The old style from before Python 2.2 no longer works. That made the whole inherit from object thing seem a little verbose, so its need was dropped. You can still use that syntax if you'd like, especially if you're writing code that has to be compatible with Python 2 and 3. Essentially, in Python 3, both of these declarations result in the same thing. This, of course, can cause some confusion. If you use the Python 3 style without the object in Python 2, you're not going to get the old new style, but the actual very old old style, and some rather unexpected class behaviors. I get why it's done. It definitely looks better without the object, but this is a massive foot gun for folks maintaining older code. So be careful if you're still straddling the Python 2, Python 3 world. Okay, enough history and potential toe removal. When should you use a class? Well, it might be easier to outline when not to. If you have a small script that doesn't have a lot of data structures, or you need really speedy code, if the code base you're maintaining already doesn't, for example, it's heavily functional, or the code is mostly procedural, your teammates will like you better if you stay consistent with the code that exists already. If you are writing object-oriented code, you don't necessarily have to use inheritance to gain the advantage of code reuse. Inheritance can be described as an is-a relationship. For example, a car is a vehicle, so I might have my car class extend my vehicle class. One alternative to this structure is a has a relationship. This is also known as composition. This is the case where the attribute of one object references another. You can still do duct typing and polymorphic interfaces using this mechanism, and there aren't any surprises. When someone changes a base class, say adding a method, that trickles down to the children. With composition, that won't affect you unless you want to call it on the related object. There are some special kinds of composition that have their own names. 
Delegation is composition with execution handoff. Your object references another object, and the owner has methods within which it calls the delegated object. It's a kind of wrapper. If you took part two of this course, the hex color container example was a list delegate, exposing its own interface but implementing the underlying storage with a reference to a non-public list. This was a kind of delegation. An even more specific kind of composition is dependency injection. It's still a wrapper, but this time what you're wrapping is an object that is passed in. Each call gets proxied to the injected object. This means you can change the behavior of the wrapping class by passing in, injecting, a different object. This pattern can be useful when you want to perform similar tasks on related objects. For example, if you've got a class that abstracts database interactions, injecting an object that implements specific database details allows you to code against the generic interface while someone else worries about how it is done. The big advantage here is someone else can write another injectable object that implements the right interface, say for yet another database, and everything will still work. This pattern can be very useful for writing more testable code. Testing your generic database object is hard without actually touching a database, but if you injected a fake database implementation, you could test the wrapper with this delegate. This is kind of what mock classes are doing for you. This pattern actually makes me a little uncomfortable. It isn't really the pattern's fault, but my own experience. I've bumped into a couple of coders in my life who thought this approach was a religion and thought you should inject all the things. If the only use of a baseball bat you ever saw was it smacking you in the face, it wouldn't be a surprise if you flinched watching the New York Yankees. So injection kind of makes me flinch. Object-oriented coding started to come into its own in the 1980s. At the time, there were different languages out there experimenting with the right way of doing things and plenty of academic papers on the subject. The first version of C++ was actually a transpiler, converting C++ into C code before calling the C compiler. The work in this space resulted in a bunch of tenets describing the right way to do things. SOLID is an acronym that covers five of these governing principles. The principles are single responsibility, it should do only one thing, the open-closed principle, you should be able to extend an object without mucking with its internals. Liskov substitution principle, a harder way of saying duct typing. Interface segregation principle, don't put stuff in an object that won't be used. And the dependency inversion principle that says interacting objects should use an interface between them. Some of this stuff may seem a little obvious if you've done a lot of object-oriented coding already, but it's obvious because of the work done historically that makes it so. Solid is the work of several people. The concepts in Solid, along with a bunch of others, were in a paper by Robert C. Martin in 2000. Martin is better known as Uncle Bob in the programming world and was one of the creators of the Agile Manifesto. A few years later, Michael Feathers munched it together in an easier-to-remember acronym. Those two don't get all the credit. The Liskov substitution principle is named after Barbara Liskov, who came up with it. So it's a real amalgamation of effort. The rest of this course uses SOLID to talk about what good object-oriented coding looks like. All right, let's dive into something SOLID. Well, that sounds ill-advised, doesn't it? In the previous lesson, I talked about whether to use an object-oriented approach in Python. This lesson kicks off the SOLID principles. The S in SOLID is the single responsibility principle. It is stated as, a class should have only one reason to change. Let's break that down. What a class does is expressed through the methods it provides, its responsibility. If your class implements more than one task, you're breaking the single responsibility principle and you should break your class up into multiple classes. This is all about the separation of concerns. Let's look at an example in code. Consider this class that abstracts a file. Its interface includes a method for reading a file, a method for writing a file, one for compressing a file to zip format, and one for decompressing from zip format. 
Does this seem like a single responsibility? Yeah, not really. Not all the file objects you create are going to need compressing and uncompressing. Only zip files do. That's a sign that you're doing too many things in the class. The solution is to break this up into more pieces. Instead of having a single file manager, this module implements the same functionality as two different classes. The file manager class abstracts the reading and writing of the class, having the read and write methods from before. While the zip file manager contains the compress and decompress methods. I haven't done it here, but you could imagine a method on zip file manager that returns a file manager object pointing to the uncompressed file that was ready for reading and writing. You want to separate out your responsibilities because it means less to keep in your head while you're maintaining the class. Smaller chunks of code tend to be easier to test and debug. This isn't just because they're smaller, but because you can separate out expected behavior. For example, if you think back to my bad file manager, what does it mean to read or write to it if it's still compressed? Does the class implement that, or would it muck things up? Single responsibility doesn't mean only a single method. You still want all the methods that make sense for the data on the class, assuming you pick the right data abstraction. The better file manager needs both the read and write methods, but mixing in compress and decompress makes things messy. Fundamentally, the file and zip file classes have different purposes and do different things. One is for reading and writing a file, the other is for compressing and decompressing. That's not to say you couldn't come up with a better abstraction. You could build a version of the zip class that only implements read and write, decompressing and reading, or decompressing and writing, then compressing back when it's done. Uncle Bob's paper on the topic tells a story where he was writing code for a multi-purpose printer. Originally, he just had a printer class, but maintaining the fax machine and scanning functionality in that class didn't make a lot of sense. So instead, he split it up into three different classes. That's the S. Next up, the O in solid.